I would like to invite your attention to the gospel according to Matthew chapter 6. And especially we will be focusing on verses 1 through 18. Gospel according to Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 18. Uh, this part, I know that this is a large portion, so we are not going to read it, but each session when we are you know, going to discuss or we are going to share, we are going to you know, uh, uh, engage in uh, you know, thinking and uh, think to thinking together, and we will read uh, and, uh, as the, you know, uh, the need of the verses. So when we see Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 18, that part is coming as part of the Sermon on the Mount of Jesus Christ. When we read Matthew chapter 5, chapters 5, 6, and 7, where we can see Jesus Christ is giving his lecture to his disciples as well as the people. These are some of the you know, must-follow teachings of Jesus Christ. The Sermon on the Mount, we know that when we, it, he starts with uh, the beatitude, you know, beatitude that, you know, every Christian believer, every follower of Jesus Christ must understand, learn, and follow it. And we need to, we need to practice that in our life. Then, you know, definitely God will, you know, help us and bless us. But... We are not going to look all that three chapters, but we are going to look only the part, the, the, the part chapter 6, verses 1 to 18. In that part, we can see we are going to focus on three things. Three things, especially God is, Jesus Christ is focusing, that his, he wants his disciples to understand that one, to learn about that one, and also to teach their followers in the future time, even including you know, us in the 21st century. And this part is, I, if I title it, it's, I'm, I took the title portion from the verse 1. And it says, the acts of righteousness. I, already, I shared lightly one of the meetings, one of the fasting prayers in the past. But you know, I would like to, you know, all of us to think together about uh, these three acts of righteousness. From that, when we see the three acts of the one is talking about giving. That is, when we read chapter 6, verses 2 to 4, it talks about giving, the importance of giving, the benefit of giving, the benefit of receiving, the blessing of you know, giving and taking or receiving. The second act of righteousness is praying. That we can see, uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 5, to 15, that's the whole part. But when we read chapter 5 to 8, we can see that Jesus is giving little lecture about the prayer, you know, when you pray. But the second part of that is coming as a, the, you know, Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray that one. Then the third one is that the, the act of our righteousness is fasting, which is mentioned in Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 to 18. So these three things we will be focusing, you know, uh, uh, very briefly. Then, uh, you know, uh, we'll ask God to bless us and God to, you know, act uh, in our life so that we will, be, uh, we will become a great blessing to people around us, wherever it may be. So, but before Jesus Christ gives this, the, the lectures on these three acts of righteousness, he gives one condition. The condition is that is very specifically mentioned in, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. It says like this, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. This is the conditions. It's very good to give, very good to fast, very good to pray. But if you do that, you know, for people to see that we are doing that, it's not a problem. It's not a sin. But one thing that you know you won't receive, we won't receive anything from God the Father. That is, you know, the condition he just kept in the first verse. Then he keep on telling the first part. When we think about giving, we can see verses two to four. It says like this. Let me read that for you. So when you give to the needy. Do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, 
to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. These are the two verses that Jesus Christ is teaching to his disciple. They, he just called them out of you know, their profession, worldly profession. They were all well-to-do. They were you know, fishers, fishers of men. Some of them were tax collectors. Some of them were you know, doing some other you know, works. Whatever it may be, they were, doing, they were all doing good in their profession, but God brought them out of that profession, and God is going to give them, Jesus Christ is going to give them something extra, something, you know, in you know, other job than what they were doing it. So that's what, so sometimes they may be dealing with so many other things. They, have, they may be receiving at the same time. They may be, you know, giving, but, you know, he wanted the people to know, that the followers to know that giving is good always. Giving is important. Giving to God is more important. Anything. Sometimes when we think about, you know, giving, we always think about, you know, giving somebody something to the poor people. We can give to anybody. We can give our time. We can give, give, give you, know, you know, what you have other than money, your time, your support, moral support. You can spend, you know, you know, some, you know, minutes with, you know, our, you know, friends in school or friends, our friends in our workplace, colleagues or friends in, in, in our neighborhood. So it's not necessarily Jesus is talking about giving money. It's also, it's also anything that is available. We, we have extra we can give. When when Jesus Christ was, you know, teaching his disciples in Matthew chapter 25, verses 35 to uh, 40, 35 to 36, you know, there's, Jesus Christ is uh, giving an example, an, an assessment of people. You know, then, you know, he wanted to separate the gods and the lambs. Then he told gods, you go they on the left side, the lambs go to the other side. Then he said that, you know, whatever you have done, you did good for me. Then they are telling that, no, we didn't see you. We, you never came. You... Whenever you come, we are ready to give, but you never came and we didn't support you. We didn't give you anything. But Jesus, you know, telling that uh, when for I was hungry, you fed me. I was naked, you dressed me. I was in the prison, you, tr you, you, you came and visited me. I was sick, you came and, you know, you know, you know visited me. So Jesus Christ is telling, they are telling, no, we didn't do anything for you. They are telling, whatever you have done for other people, He's not telling the poor people. He's telling everybody. When you are in the hospital, you know, everybody gets sick. When they are in the sick hospital, anybody want to come and visit us, right? Uh, uh, you know, spending a few minutes with us. If we do really, willingly, definitely God is going to honor us. So that's what he meant that one when he talks in, uh, in Matthew chapter 25, verses 35 to 36. Then we can see that Jesus Christ gave everything, including his own life. What else he has to give us? Everything. It's not only for the poor people, it's for everybody. For the rich and for poor. For the needy and for anybody who is willing to come into his fold. It's already, you know, he labeled there. It is not only for you, it's also for everybody who is going to come. That's what we can see in, uh, when Jesus prayed his, uh, the, the, the intercessory prayer in John chapter 70. It's not praying for himself, praying for his disciples, praying for the people there, and also praying for people, those who are yet to become his disciples or his would-be disciples. And also when we read Luke chapter 3, verse you know, 11, it says, Anyone who has two robes should share with others who does not have one. If you, have, if you can spare food, we can you know, you know, share with that. Then when we read Proverbs chapter 25, verses 21 and 22, what does it say? Proverbs chapter 25, verses 21 to 21. Jesus is not sparing anybody, even including enemies. He's telling that if... Your enemy is hungry, feed him. 
If your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. Who knows? God will bless us. That's what you know, it says. You know, definitely, by doing that, we know that we are bringing kind of you know, shame upon that person. But the God, your Father in heaven will you know, bless us. That's what you know, when uh, uh, Apostle Paul wrote, you know, again, he quoted in uh, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 20. So giving is number one thing that when Jesus Christ taught about the acts of righteousness. And when he's not only giving, you know, and also we can see that when we read, uh, you know, Malachi chapter 3 verse 10, you know, recently we had a class on Malachi. In the, in the just recent past, in the past week maybe, past Tuesday. It's talking about giving. When we read Malachi chapter 3 verse 10, what does it say? It says, bring the whole tithe into, yeah, into storehouse, into my house, so that there will be food for everybody always. And it, the, the church does not run out of any kind of resources, physical or spiritual resources, that we have to bring everything. And the best example of giving, what I noticed is that the, 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 the offering that the poor widow, you know, put in the offering box. We remember the, the widow's, you know, offering. She has only two tiny coins. She's sitting in a large church. Maybe Jerusalem church, they are all sitting in the temple. Jesus is there. He must have given a very high lecture. Then after that, they have an offering. It's not like our offering passing by in the bag. Even if we put a $1, $5, ten, nobody bothers that because we put inside the hand. The more the God deeper, the, the smaller the amount will be. See, look at this. You know, Jesus is observing the people, those who are, you know, uh, you know bringing their offering. He's not watching all them, but he's, you know, he's sitting there watching. People are bringing their offering. Some people are walking with, the, you, know, you know, how the Pharisees and Sadducees, they wear full robe and they come. Their robes will be, you know, like a, like a wedding dress. It will be hanging and dragging. They're bringing, they bring a big box, big bag. What do they do? They bring to the offering box. Everybody look at it. Oh, he put that much. My goodness. Praise the Lord. The second person is coming, and everybody's looking. Okay, this is he, he is the other person. Everybody's singing. Okay. Big sound. Everywhere, big noise. Everybody's praising. Okay, that person, that person, everybody put enough. They give that much. But Jesus did not astonished or amazed by seeing the sound, by hearing the sound or by seeing the size of that offering. He was just casually sitting. But he noticed, you know, while during that, and also, you know, after that, everybody finished that a widow is coming with the two tiny coins. Nobody bothers sir. Who cares? Widow. Poor widow. And she brought that two coins. She doesn't want anybody to see. So she's holding very tight. She doesn't want this to lose. Because that is the whole thing she has. Her all savings, checking, and all accounts together. Put in her hand, and she's bringing that one. She can have choice. She can go and buy some food, and she can have their food, her food on that day. But she didn't want to do that one. But she brought that money. And in the temple, when she came, and she slow, slowly walked behind everybody else, went to there, slowly she put. And she backed back and went away. Nobody heard. No sound was there. But look at Jesus, sitting somewhere far. When the two Nickels, small coins, reach the bottom of that offering, you know, box or what bo offering, you know, vessel. It did not make any noise, but it made a thunder in heaven. Jesus sitting there got up and told that, you look at the, see this widow, this poor widow put whatever she has, the maximum. Not the person who brought the, the large bag, but the person that this, this poor widow brought whatever she got. And the, when 
that reached the bottom of that offering, it made a thunder in heaven. Jesus told that, yes, this widow put the maximum. That is a sacrificial giving. The other one, God gave so much, we gave part of it. That's okay. You can bring more. Okay, that's praise the Lord. God, heaven is not angry about anything, anybody. But God, heaven is happy when this poor widow put that single two coins and she had everything, nothing else. After that, she is going to go hungry. She has nothing to take home. Nothing to, you know, no, no, no money, no balance to buy anything. And that is what Jesus told them. That is a sacrificial giving. She gave the maximum. That is what Jesus said. You know, you know, you know God is expecting us to go a little extra mile maybe sometime. We don't know. And when we, can, when we read Matthew chapter, you know, uh, uh, 6 verse 3, and the, the early part of that, he is giving the principle of giving. The principle. When we give, how do we give? How to give that one? In our ignorance, we just give something and we boast about that. In our ignorance, in the churches, when we were in the past life, we say that one. I remember some people uh, give, uh, you know, uh, sometimes they, they open up the, the, the when pastors come, so they give some offering and all that. Not, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about our India. You know, sometimes if you're like 500 note, to be giving like this 500 note. I've seen it. I've seen it. I'm not making up. I'm telling, you know, the, the way. But Jesus Christ is teaching his disciples. They are new. They do business there in the marketplace, in the seashore. They don't care about anything. They don't bother about anything. Nobody can stop them. They are so courageous. They can defend anybody. They can offend anybody. They can beat up anybody. They can do anything. But they have changed now. Now Jesus Christ is training them how to be a fishers of man. When you do in this business, in the fishers of man, in God's business, you cannot act the way you are acting outside in the marketplace. You have to do in a certain standard. God has set a certain standard for us to follow. That is why he is teaching. When you give, don't give the way you did in the marketplace or the, the, the other people are doing or the ungodly people are doing, the unrighteous people are doing. But when you do, do it in secret. When we read chapter th uh, verses 3 and the early four, you know, verse 4, it says like this. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what the right hand is doing. Just imagine that much secret. Don't let the, when you take out this hand from your own pocket, let the right hand know that, you know, you know what the left hand is doing. You do it. When you do that one, Heaven will recognize that one. God the Father will recognize that one. And he will reward us. That's what the early part of verse 4 says. So that you are giving maybe in secret, then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. That is number one act of righteousness. That is giving. When you give, you give in this way. If you give in public... No, you received it. It's not that you did not receive, you received it, but you will not be receiving anything from God the Father because you already received You don't need that one. Everybody knows that, you know, you are very generous, you are very nice, you know, all that, uh, how much, you know, what, what we are doing. But when we do, if you're doing, do it very sacred. And that is the, the number one principle of, you know, God's way of giving. Do it in secret so that God in heaven will see what you are doing and he will bless you. When he bless you, the world will come to know who you are. That's what, you know, when we saw the, the seed, the kernel, the kernel of wheat, when the farmer brings the kernel of wheat, it holds uh, this kernel of wheat cannot demand the farmer, you know, farmer, my master, you put me here so that I can bear more fruit. Does it have authority? No. It takes, the farmer takes the kernel of it in his hand. He just takes and he just throw it. 
Some will fall, fall in the fall. Some will fall nearby. You know, the fall will be so big, so huge. It, it, the impact may be so high that it can, you know, break its body. No problem. But, you know, why he's, the farmer is doing that? The farmer know, knows this kernel of wheat, if I sow that particular place, it can produce more fruit. Not the kernel of wheat. It knows when it goes through the under the sea, under the earth, you know, in the soil, the rain, the, the heat, the pressure all comes and it, 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 it gives you so much trouble for that. Nobody notices. Even animals can bow, you know, walk over it. Human being can walk over it. Nobody bothers under the seed is there. But, you know, after some time when it goes through, where all this pain and suffering and water and, 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 and all kind of flood and heat and scorching and drought and everything, when the, the small sprout comes out, then people started to look. Oh, there is something there. When it grows and grows and grows, even birds of the air can come and rest in the shade. That is something we are doing, you know, as a child of God, as a servant of God, as a people of God, as a believer in Jesus Christ. We are doing. This is number one act of righteousness, which is giving. So let that be our attitude. Like Jesus told, he is teaching his disciples to us as also. Let us follow that one. Learn. Let us follow that one. Because God wanted to understand maybe certain things in our hands. Certain things that, you know, he doesn't want to understand anybody else. Maybe particularly we are called for certain, certain you know, particular things, particular ministry. You know, God will definitely entrust those ministries in our hands. And, you know, he wanted to say we are doing good in everything. The second of acts of giving is prayer, which we can see from uh, verses 5 through 15. In that, we can see the 5 through 8 is talking about, you know, the pattern, how to do prayer. You know, prayer is the most important thing one can do without much trust. You don't need to go anywhere. Anywhere, if you are standing in a bus stop, you can pray there. If you're sitting in a closet, you can buy a war room, you know. If you have a uh, DVD, if you get a uh, DVD of war room, you know. It's amazing. It's about prayer. That changing the closet for prayer, where the fight is really taking place. Outside, nobody knows. Inside the closet. And that is anywhere we can do. That's one of the important things. That why? Because that we are talking to God. We are not talking to anybody else. We are talking to God. Jesus is teaching his disciples, when you pray, go into your room, close the door behind you, and kneel down and pray. Because you're praying to God. God is watching you. Prayer is talking to God. Continue to talk to God. Otherwise, we will lose our connection with God. You know, like uh, sometimes, you know, like, uh, you know, Apostle Paul said, uh, Pray without ceasing. Always continue, constantly pray. Anytime you can be thankful, anytime you can be prayerful, anything you can tell God, nobody will hear. And God in heaven will hear even, even, even if you just think that in your heart. You don't need to pronounce it through your mouth. It no need to come as a word. It's let it be inside. Just think that God, help me, help me. Definitely God will help us. And don't stop that conversation. Once you stop conversation with God, you are distending our, we are distending from God. You know, if you have friends and all that, if we don't talk for some time, you know, we don't feel like talking. Right? We lose our friendship. We disconnect our relationship. No, I don't want to talk that, you know, it's, it's many days, many weeks. No, you know, you know that kind of things. So always, is my, my encouragement, as we Pray to God like we need to talk to each other. I have, a, you know, let's, uh, I, 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 you know, talk to our spiritual leaders, people who have dedicated their life for our, you know, service, spiritual leaders. Children, talk to your parents very often. Always, something. Just say a story. Just say hi. How are you, mom? How are you, dad? Whatever. And talk, keep on talking. Parents, talk to our children. When they come from school, talk to them. We don't know what they are going through in the school. Very hard sometimes. We don't understand that. 
So when they come from school with so much homework or the, you know, so much pressure, you know, you know, pressure and all that, just talk to them. Talk to our siblings. Don't lose connection. Talk to our you know, you know, teachers, our pastors, our teachers in the school. Talk to our colleagues in the, in, the, in the workplace. Talk to the troublemakers more. Say hello, intentionally. How are you doing today? I was thinking about you today. Tell them. I'm, I was praying for you. Are you, uh, you, know, you know, I was praying for you just like that I thought I was praying for you. Just tell them. Crash into their you know, privacy and tell them that you know, you know, I was you know, thinking about you and I was praying you, you know, how are you doing? That's enough. You don't wait for so much you know, them to say. That may be, a, that may be a, a, a starting point for us. Next time when they say, they will smile a little bit. Next time they will say, they say hi. Then you know, that way they talk. It's not like when we go to a Bible college, first when we go hug and all that, then after that we say shake and then they say hi, then we go that way, decide. Not that way. We lose our contacts. That's the way God, our heaven, Father in heaven, feels when we don't talk to him. Every father likes our children to come and tell their situation, their, what they're going through, whatever it may be. Like we, we heard during uh, one of the, and you know, recently, you know, Billy Graham's uh, you know, funeral, that one of the daughter came and told that she was messed up her life, and uh, then finally she don't know what to tell father and mother and sibling. Everybody you know, tried to, to control, to, to, to stop her from what she's doing, but she didn't know because she said that she can do anything. Finally, she failed, and she's coming back to her father. Then you know, father is standing there and telling that, you're welcome. He forgave her. So we need to always, we need to talk to our friends, our, our parents, our children, our siblings, our, you know, colleagues, our, 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 our church members, everybody, everywhere. We all like that one. So in the same way, we need to pray to God constantly. Moses prayed to God every time. Every time he had some issue, he went and kneeled down before God because nobody else is there for him to support. For, for, uh, there's no, he doesn't get any other support from anybody else because everybody else is standing against, including his own sister and his own brother. He has no place to go. He's, he went, every time he comes, he paused, fall before God and he prayed to God and God answered him. The biggest prayer, maybe in my thought, he prayed is that when, you know, when, you, when we read uh, Numbers chapter 14, uh, 13 onwards, we can see that Moses is sending the 12 spies to explore the land of Canaan and bring the report. When they brought the report, they told that we can't do anything. 11, 10 of them said that we cannot do anything. They are like giants. They're, you know, everything is huge. We cannot, we cannot defeat them. God got very angry, very upset. He thought, I'm going to destroy everybody. Then he told Moses very personally, he told that, you know, I will make you into a great nation stronger than this one. Moses went and fell before God and told that, don't do that, God. Anybody will welcome that kind of approach from God. It's nobody, else, nobody else is supporting that. Nobody else is suggesting that one. It is God himself is supporting that. I am going to destroy the entire generation, six lakh men and all the people are in, along with them. We are going to destroy and I'm going to make you a great nation, a nation greater and stronger than these people. He went and kneeled down before God and prayed that don't do that one. And that is one of the, the most the, the influential prayer for me to understand that, to take that one. And Jesus, you know, every time he got a chance, every time, every event, that big crusades or meeting or personal talk or house meeting or every time, he went back to prayer. He wanted to talk to God. The, one of the, the most influential historic prayer is the prayer in the Mount of Olives, just the previous night of his crucifixion. Where else to turn? Who else to turn? Only Father is there. He went and told Father, if possible, you know, remove this cup from me. Father said, no. Second time he went, he said, no. Third time he said, no. That your will be done. That's what he said. You look at Apostle Paul. He's you know, some pain in his stomach, in his body. He went unto God, help me. I want healing. God said, no. My grace is sufficient for you. Too much pain. He thought that Paul is also very stubborn. He doesn't want to go back and ask. But because of, maybe because of that severe pain, he went back second time, asked God, God, 
I want healing. I want a touch. God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. Jesus is same. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. But even then, Paul went a third time, maybe because of the severity of that pain. Third time also, God said, Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for you. And he said that, you know, I am stronger when I am feel. That's what he said. And that's the way, you know, always we need to pray and ask God to help us. And he's telling the, 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 the uh, principle of prayer in verse 6, verse 6a. It says like this. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Same pattern. That is the second act of righteousness. Do when you pray, pray in secret. I mean, it's not necessarily you, 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 every time you go, but, you know, that's certain time when you have personally, we have something, you have to pray, you have to pray in public. That's different. It's, we are not talking about that kind of prayer. We are talking about when your need become urgent. Closet is the only place. The closed door is the only place where God overlook in your matter. He analyzes it. He sees how much the need is, you know, urgent. And based on that, he will act on that one. You look at Jesus Christ. He went every. He says like this. You know, every time he, he he taught in the temple, and then every evening he go to the solitary place in the mountains and riverside or somewhere. He prayed there. There he got the, the power. He come back again next day. He teach. Deliverance happens. Sick people are healed. The dead are raised. All these kind of things. Because why? Because he, sit, he had a personal conversation with his father in secret so the public people do not know. That is why people ask, is he the son of Joseph? Is he the son of you know, David? You know? They are doubtful. But he received the power every day because he, he kept the connection with his heavenly father. The number two acts of righteousness, praying. The third one, the act of righteousness is Fasting, which we can see, chapter 6, verses 16 to 18. And this is also, you know, same principle. It says that when you fast, do not look sober as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces and faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth. They have received their reward in full. But when you fast, 7 verse 18, verse 17, but when you fast, put oil on your heart and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to God, your Father, who is unseen, and you, your Father in heaven, will do, see what you are doing in secret will reward you. That's act number three, the acts of righteousness number three, fasting. It has so much, when, when, sometimes when we don't eat food and all that, we feel very weak and very feel very uncomfortable. But when we feel that one, when we're genuinely doing and fasting, the more strength comes into it. It, it brings the strength. It's not that we are physically, we are becoming weaker and weaker, but it brings strength to our spiritual being, spiritual, you know, you know, you know, man or, you know, our being, then that can release power for our spiritual strength. In the, in the, throughout the Bible history, we can see that, you know, the, about the fasting, how many people fast, many people fast. The most, there are many examples for, you know, Fasting. But let me, let me, let me highlight, you know, one, 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 uh, that fasting that Moses did. How many days Moses fasted when he was uh, in the presence of God? Forty night, forty days. He went to Mount Horeb, kneeling down before God, having conversation, 
without food, without water, all these 40 days, because he knows that what the people are doing downstairs in the valley, they are not really following God. They have seen all kinds of miracles from God. They have received all kinds of blessings from God. They have seen all the glory of God, the splendor of God, everything. But still, these people are genuinely not following. So Moses has to wait there and ask God and plead with him, with, him, with God. 40 days and 40 nights. Down, people thought that Moses is gone. He's not coming back. He is dead there. Who knows? Who was with him? Anybody else was with him? No, nobody was with him. But halfway through, there was a person waiting, for, waiting on him. Who was that? Joshua. If some people, if Joshua was a different kind of person, person, you know, he was thinking something else, he would have come and told that after 20, 25 days, you know, guys, Moses is not there. I, I tried to look around. I called him and can't hear anybody. He might be dead, so I will be your leader. No. He waited there. He did not lose his hope. Joshua did not lose his hope on God and on his master, Moses. Compare his life, Moses and Joshua's relationship with Elijah and Elisha. Elijah told Joshua, Elijah, Elijah told Elisha at Kilgan, he told that God is sending me to the next station, Bethel. You stay here, take care of this ministry, the, the school of you know, prophecy. He said, no, as long as God is alive, you are alive, I'm going to come with you. He didn't wait there. When Bethel reached, it's a good place. You know, Gilgan is a, one of the you know, places where, you know, the children of Israel camped after crossing the River Jordan. And where the new generation, the older generation died there before the crossing the Jordan. And the new generation came. There is a new covenant. The God's covenant is renewed by circumcising all the male, about 20, uh, male of you know, the nation of Israel who are ready to fight. They made a new law there. That's a good place to stay around. A, a rededication. A, a covenant renewed. It's good to stay here, no problem. But Joshua said, sorry, Elisha said that, no, I am not going to stay here. I am going to hang out with you. I am going to follow you. Wherever you go, I am going to come with you. He went to the next station, Bethel. You know, Bethel is the place where Abraham built a, a, an altar for God. He offered sacrifice where Jacob had a you know, vision about the heaven and God and all kind of things. It's the best place to stay there. He told that, Elijah, Elijah told, you stay here. This is the best place, Bethel, the house of God. God's presence is here always. Angels of God going up and down. You have no worry about, you don't need to worry about anything. You stay here. He said, no. I'm not going to stay here. I know what I'm going to receive. He was determined to, to receive what God has promised to him. He was a man who was plowing his, you know, his, taking care of his farming land, plowing with a tall pair of you know, oxen and all, 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 all stuff he had. But now that is not my business. I left that one. I sacrificed the, the oxen. I used the, the, the yoke the, as a firewood to sacrifice the oxen. I have nothing behind. Nothing is pulling me back. I have you know, left that place. I came and I'm following you. I have to follow until I receive that twofold blessing. They came to Jericho. He told them, you stay here. That's a place where they had challenges, wars, the fleshly desires and you know, the, the spiritual you know, desires. They the all you know, fight each other. One is trying to take over the other one. He stay here. You can be succeeded. You can be you know, successful. You can win. You, can, you will be become somebody here in the Jordan. You are a successful person. No, I, he's, Elisha said, no, I am not going to stay here. I am going to follow you until you know, I receive what you want. Then they crossed the Jordan and they went. Then he said that, now my journey ends. Tell now what do you want me to do for you? No doubt, I need double portion. If you see I'm taken, it is yours. If you don't see, it's not yours. Praise the Lord. Do we, do we have that kind of such determination? Like Joshua waited 40 days there in the middle of that one, waiting for Moses, thinking that Moses is alive or not. But he knows that Moses will come back. He's a man of God, called by God, anointed by God. He will come back. 
He had assurance. Down in the valley, they didn't have assurance. But he had assurance. That's why he became the successor for him. And Elisha became the successor of Elijah. Fasting is kind of draining our, our, our strength, losing our, disfiguring our, our face, all looking very tired. No, it brings glory. When Moses came out from the Mount Horeb, after 40 days, his face was shining like anything, like the face of God. In the, in, in, when he was traveling, and it was not like that. So, dear friends, when we, when we literally trusting in the Lord and fast for our reason, whatever may be the reason, definitely God will see that and he will reward us. Then look at the life of, you know, Nehemiah fasted and he got, you know, answered to build the city when they heard the, good, the news. And prop, you know, Elijah fasted fast 40 days. Like almost he has to walk from one place to the other place. 14 days, 14 nights. For what? To anoint Elisha as his successor and to anoint Jehu as the uh, king of Israel and, yeah, and to anoint Hazael as the king of Aram. These are the ministries they have to, they have to, when they do something, ministry, something like that, they have to do, you know, fasting for a longer period. All ministries were very successful. And when Jesus fasted 40 nights and 40 days just prior to his public ministry, Satan tried to, you know, tempt him. When we are weak in our body, all the things will come, offers will come. If you are weak, definitely we will take that one. But if you receive the call of God in our life, if we have seen the glory of God in our life, we will not turn back from that call. We will not move back because we have seen, we know that who called us and we have seen the glory of God. Act, the acts of righteousness number three, fasting. All these people, why did I say this afternoon? We had a wonderful weekend last week with Dr. Toby and Pastor Walzen and all of us together. You know, they're leading us in, 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 in teaching us. We received, we have seen the way God spoke to us. Individually, differentially, people talk, God talked to us according to our need, according to our situation. And now we need to receive that one and we need to forward together for a greater purpose. For a double-fold blessing. Let me conclude with the, the conviction that Ruth had when she met Naomi, her mother-in-law. And when there was a time that they had to part, Naomi has to come back to her own place because the farming is gone over. Now things are there, I have to come back. Then she has to say goodbye to his two daughter-in-laws. But Ruth was not ready to obey Naomi's you know, command. And she said this way. Naomi told, say goodbye and you know, go back to your own people. But she said, when we read Ruth chapter 6 to 1, Ruth chapter 1, verses 6, 6 to 18, it says like this. You know, the now, now Ruth responds, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. Where you are buried, I will be buried. Can we make a treaty with Jesus Christ today? This is a two human being, Naomi and her daughter-in-law, Ruth. They are make, entering into a covenant relationship with their human perspective. And can we make a covenant relationship, renew our covenant relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ? Definitely, he is going to bless us. He is going to take us into next level. Can we say that, Jesus, wherever you lead me, I will lead, I will follow. And whatever may be the life you are going to give me, I'm ready to take up that one. No matter where, if he is there, we should go with him. And we should ask he to bless us so that we can cling on to him. Like Ruth clung to Naomi and they came for, you know, that she became one of the great, great, great grandmother of Jesus Christ. 
And let's follow this, this, the teachings of Jesus. That's number one. The acts of uh, the righteousness, number one. Fasting, sorry. Uh, giving, praying, and fasting. Let's do it for a, for a greater purpose. Don't just casually do it. Just do it for a great purpose. Definitely, God will bless us. Let me conclude here. 